Well, thank you. Um, let me allocate my few minutes to two things. First of all, the way money is spent on energy um, in cities. Uh, and secondly, how that might change and the kinds of energy that we could bring in to um, give a different look to cities and deal with the many problems we have environmentally, social problems as well, by a great U-turn in the way we, we use energy. Because right now we face, uh, particularly this city and New York, in the city here and in Wall Street, a huge financial conundrum, and it is this. If we are to perform in Paris, um, as we just heard, uh, what we're going to have to do is keep global warming below a danger ceiling of about two degrees Celsius, and to have a chance of doing that, um, any number of bodies will tell you from the IPCC right through the IEA to the financial think tank that I have the privilege of chairing here in, in London, Carbon Tracker, that we can only burn somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of remaining fossil fuels. The rest have to stay in the ground. Uh, and right now, um, those deposits underground are accounted by the fossil fuel companies as though they are assets at completely, precisely zero risk of being impaired in value. And that's dysfunctional. It's a dysfunctional as aspect of the entire capital markets. And some of you here, I'm sure, are following the work of Carbon Tracker in the reports that the brilliant analysts in that team that I have the privilege of chairing uh, produced in 20, uh, 2011, uh, 2013, and then again this year. Three reports. I won't go into detail of them. I don't have time. But uh, basically, we go company by company and stock exchange by stock exchange, getting ever more granular, looking at where there is risk of money being wasted. Now, here's the other thing. These uh, deposits that I've been talking about are existing proved reserves. And right now, these companies go out every year, and they, they spend every year hundreds of billions, and over years, um, numerous trillions in trying to turn resources into reserves and put them on their books as assets at precisely zero risk of, of impairment. And if you're not following this drama, please, please do, because uh, in 25 years of working on climate change, I've never seen a theme get traction so quickly as this has, particularly over the last year. And as people like to say in the City of London, the markets are moving already on the recognition that there is risk that assets might be devalued, that money spent on capex going forward might be wasted. Almost whether or not the climate um, negotiators deliver in Paris, it's the risk that they might do so in the minds of the capital markets that's creating the interesting drama. And there are two themes to this. One is divestment, uh, and we're seeing right across the world in cities um, on university campuses, foundations, and yesterday, God bless them, the British Medical Association divesting from fossil fuels, saying we're not going to invest in fossil fuels anymore. We're going to invest in clean energy going forward. That's one uh, way. The other way that um, in Carbon Tracker we think is actually more interesting is people stay invested in energy companies and are beginning to put serious pressure on the capital expenditure plans of these energy companies. And these plans are, frankly speaking here tonight, after one of these very nice bottles of beer, are beyond dysfunctional. The capex of the oil and gas industry has trebled since 2000. And in the case of the big oil companies, what they're finding in terms of oil and gas is going down, despite that increasing um, expenditure. That's not a great recipe for a business model going into the future. So um, already that uh, pressure is beginning to show. For example, Shell have had to cancel or put or freeze their plans to go um, and drill in a buccaneer fashion, crashing their rigs against the rocks of Alaska as they did last year, um, uh, looking for oil and gas in the frozen north. And there are a number of other such examples. So then finally, let me move to the flip side of the coin, because, you know, if all these trillions are not going to be placed at risk of being wasted by the capital markets in conventional energy, particularly fossil fuels, where are they going to go? 
And here we come to clean energy, and if I may be unashamedly a pro-solar here, those of you who know me know that I set up my solar company because of my fears about over-reliance on fossil fuels. Um, others who don't know me so well or who don't give a damn say that don't believe any, anything this guy says because he's got a dog in the race and simply wants to sell more solar panels. But here, here's my thought. Right now, um, that we're on a cusp of a revolution with this technology. Uh, again, here in the City of London, analysts talk about a terror dome, a very evocative term. A terror dome refers to the systemic cost down in the manufacturing of solar. And if you plot it, as Alliance Bernstein have done recently, against the typical lifespan of a fossil fuel project, that's a couple of decades or three, uh, then from 2006 to the present day, there's something that looks like a vertical, near vertical wall. And that's what they call the terror dome because of what it's doing to the business models of utilities already, along with our sister wind. Uh, in Germany, for example, 25% uh, of electricity now over the year is coming from solar and wind, and that's going to increase going forward. Uh, and it's destroying the business models, the profitability of utilities just at that small level of contribution to global primary energy mix. And what it's going to do going forward, because these trends are going to continue, there's nothing to stop the cost down in solar. We will intersect with the cost down that's happening in batteries as well. And Alliance Bernstein, McKinsey's, and others will tell you that what's coming for the oil and gas industry, because their problems are already, is that there's going to be this suite of technologies which London can be and should be and must be in the front row of developing, will be able to create a death spiral in the business model of the traditional oil and gas companies as well. So counterintuitive and um, wishful thinking, as this may sound like, huge change is coming. And all the incumbents can do is slow it down somewhat, which they do with a variety of depressing tactics. Um, but they can only slow it down. And there is going to be a revolution. And cities like London have a wonderful opportunity. And we're, you know, we're not, we have to play catch up with the Germans and the Chinese increasingly. But you know, as you go around this city now, you can see elements of this future. Go look at Blackfriars Bridge, the biggest solar bridge in the world, which my company put up um, a solar-powered uh, bridge, which you know is a sort of icon of what can be done in, a, in, in an aesthetic way within the built environment. We don't need great big power stations on the fringes of our cities. We can build them in to our cities going forward. So both in the financing of the future and the actual visualization and creation of it, we have big opportunities in London, and I very much hope we take them.